Hey ACT students, this is Kat at Magoosh, and today we're going to talk about common rules you need to know for the ACT. Now there are a lot of common rules out there, but I have boiled them down into five general areas that you really need to commit to memory. So I'm going to switch over to a screencast and we'll go over those in a little more detail. I'm going to give you some pointers on how to use commas in these particular situations. And this is not an exhaustive list. It's not an exhaustive coverage on commas. Most of us learn this at some point or another, or most of us learn a good deal of this, but very few of us retain it. It takes review, it takes practice, and I'm going to give you the brunt of what you need to know about commas. So starting here with the basics, one of the first things we learn about commas often in grade school is that they're used to separate items on a list. Specifically, if we have three or more items, these could be nouns, adjectives, um, events, we use commas after each of the descriptions. My best friend is tall, smart, caring, and a bit twisted. And there is a comma after each one. This comma here before the and, that's an optional comma. The ACT is not going to test you on it because some people leave it in, some people eliminate it. I always include this comma, just I think it's easier to remember that there is a comma after each of these descriptions. Her backpack typically contains a phone, keys, practice gear, a binder, and random mugshots. Same thing here. The only thing I want to point out is just noticing that like practice gear, that's two words, but it's one concept. And that's why we don't have a comma here. But of course we do in between each of these, um, basically these ideas, these items in a list. She taught her dog how to beg for change, catch a frisbee, and play dead three basic things we're looking at. One action is begging for change, the other is catching a frisbee, the other is playing dead. So commas in between each of these behaviors. And also notice here that we, when we have our adjectives right before a noun, so my tall, smart, caring friend is named Adrian, we don't have a comma between the last adjective and the noun. Next thing to go over here, dates. And I know a lot of you have pretty good ideas, pretty good sense of when you add commas, when you're talking about a date of the year, but you might learn something new. I learned something new the first time I reviewed this after it had been many years, so hang tight. Basic idea, we use commas if we have three or more items in our reference to a date, as with the following. I was born on February 29th, 2000. There are three items, a February, a date, and a year, we have a comma, not between the first and the second, but between the second and the third. On February 29th, 2020, I will be five years old. Here we still have the three items, month, date, and year, but we get this other comma here because we didn't end the sentence. And so we don't get a comma between the first and second. We do between the second and third. And then we also do after the third. The only reason we didn't have it up here was because the sen sentence ended but otherwise we would have had a comma there as well. All right, a lot of people don't know that. So there is a comma after the last thing in your date description, which is often the year. My sweet 16 will be in February 2064. We do not have a comma here because we only have two items, not, not three. We actually use commas in geographical locations with just two or more. I am taking a road trip from Portland, Oregon, to Portland, Maine. What you see here is we have the comma between the city and the state, even though there are only two terms here mentioned, right? What's I think a little bit more interesting or less um, commonly unknown uh, is that we get this comma after the state as well. So it's, a, it's similar to what I was showing you in the last example. We get this weird comma at the end of our little series. But what's different with geography is we only need two to kick off that whole trend. So we get the one between the first and second term, and then we get another comma after the second term. Here we have Portland, <clears throat> Portland, Maine. We have a comma here, and the sentence ends. Otherwise, we would have a comma here as well. I might even drive from Maine to Montreal, Quebec, Canada for a festival. Same thing here. I'm just giving you one extra term, and I know we don't usually say both Quebec and Canada. It's kind of understood one or the other, but for educational purposes, and you see we have this, again, this kind of weird comma at the end of our list of three. And you also notice that we don't have a comma here. If it said, I might drive from Portland, comma, Maine, 
then we would have that comma, but we just have one term. So none of the comma rules kick in for this little bit. Okay, fantastic. You're still with me. I wanna give you a little chance to comment and contribute yourself. Your turn to practice. In one to three sentences, write a comment down below the video about a trip you took. Specify the location, use three or more adjectives in the sequence like we looked at before, and of course put commas in all the correct places. So for instance, I might say, um, I went to the cold, rugged, majestic city of Anchorage, Alaska last year. Or if I really wanted to show off, maybe I would say exactly what date I went. And the sentence would just be plastered with commas. So that's what I want to see. Lots of commas, lots of interesting cities or towns. So now we're moving on to some what I consider to be intermediate topics. First here, quotation use. We use a comma immediately before a quote if the sentence has an introduction right before the quote. You're going to see an example in a second. And the quote is what I'm calling here an actual utterance. Okay, that's just words. So let's look at examples. My teacher began class by saying, today we'll review some of Benjamin Franklin's most notable sayings. There is a comma here. There is a comma here because this is the introductory part of the sentence. We have a quote here. We can quote without these little introductions. I mean, we see that all the time. Quotes can begin at the, a sentence. But much of, much of the time we have these little introductions and this aspect of is this an actual utterance? What do I mean by that? What I mean is that is this verb here that comes directly before the quote, is this something that was actually said or done or written by the quoted? And just know that that verb here has to be the verb that was taken by the person who's being quoted, the saying. Who did the saying? The teacher. And if that's not clear, hopefully it will be when I show you some other examples. If there isn't a verb directly before the quote that refers to the actions of the person being quoted, we either drop the punctuation entirely or we use a colon. So let's say that, you know, we're still in the Ben Franklin class. Here's an example of a short quote. The student's listening to the teacher and maybe is thinking to his or herself, I'm not a fan of the phrase, time is money which is attributed to Ben Franklin. I put this in red here just to point out there is no comma here. Why is there no comma? There is no verb here that is referring to Ben Franklin's actions. Time is money was quoted by Ben Franklin, but the phrase, that's just a noun. Um, if she said, I'm not a fan of, I, or I really didn't like it when Mr. Franklin said, time is money, then there would be a comma because said is a verb that was performed by the quoted. But here we just have a noun, so there is no punctuation at all. Let's look at what happens if we have a slightly longer quote. Okay, by longer quote, there's no like super clear cut, um, I don't know, cut off, but usually about five words or more, around four or five words or more, you use a colon. And so here's the same student thinking to his or herself, it's easier to appreciate the quote wish not so much to live long as to live well. And we don't have a comma here because appreciate is not the actual action that was being taken by Ben Franklin. And we do have a colon here because we have a longer quote. Okay, so that's the chances that's gonna come up on the ACTs probably yeah, maybe one in four. It's not tested on every test. Some of the other things I've gone over are typically tested on every test. So this is sort of icing on the cake. Let's get a grasp of the whole terrain here because we still have some more topics to cover. Okay, let's talk about names. So in the case of names, when we're addressing another person directly, maybe in a writing, a letter, an email, or just talking to them, what we do is we sandwich the person's name. And we do that with um, some combination of commas and periods, or it could be like exclamation marks or question marks, something at the end of a sentence. And I'll show you what that looks like. Um, I'm showing you examples of, let's say, Adrian's yearbook. One classmate wrote, Adrian, it was fun being in class with you. And we get a comma right after Adrian. It's, san it's not sandwiched because it's the beginning of the sentence, and we don't put punctuation at the beginning of sentences. Second, I know you'll have a bright future, Adrian. 
comma here, sandwich. Here, it's the end of a sentence, so we use a period. And then if it's in the middle of a sentence, thank you, comma, Adrian, comma, for being a decent lab partner. And it doesn't have to just be a name. It could be like a title. So you might say, you know, thank you, professor, for giving me an A, something like that. It, could, it doesn't have to be a person's name. The point is, is that you're referencing directly the person that you're talking to and you're using some kind of a title, their name or a, a substitute. And now we get to clauses. And this is definitely an abbreviated version of clauses, of commas, sentence constructions. Um, there's so much more I could talk about. I really tried to think about how to give you the nuts and bolts here for clauses. And for those of you who really are just looking for review, I thought it might be helpful if I just showed you the main points right off the bat, because that might mean something to you right then. Um, it can be helpful to sort of know where we're going here. And the two things I'm going to cover is just that when we have an independent clause and we want to join it with another independent clause, we will have a comma if we also have what's called a coordinating conjunction. And there are four, seven of them, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. And I'm going to go over this in more detail, but that's rule one. The second time we often see commas and sentences, if we have what I'm just calling here an other clause, a uh, non-independent, it could be a dependent clause, but it could be some other types of clauses as well. And then following that, a comma, and then an independent clause. In that case, we also have a comma. In most other cases, we do not have commas. There are some exceptions. But when it comes to complex sentences and compound sentences, really these are the two constructions. So now I'm going to go over both of these in a little more detail. An independent clause has a subject and a verb, and it contains no fragments, and it can work as a sentence on its own. So check out these two independent clauses. We've got, I need to do homework, I'd rather bake brownies. These are both independent clauses. They are both potential sentences in their own right. They don't have to be combined with anything. They can work as their own sentences, but because they're kind of short, we often do like to combine them. And even right now, even just kind of think, what word, if you were going to put a word in between these two and make this all into one sentence, what word might you choose? It's pretty likely that you, as you were thinking about this, chose a word that is considered one of the coordinating conjunctions, which I'm going to go over in the next slide here. And if so, you would want a comma here. Okay, so the um, order is going to be independent clause, comma, coordinating conjunction, independent clause, period. And let's look at what those coordinating conjunctions are. A lot of you know these as fanboys. That's kind of the little saint mnemonic to help you remember. They are words that are going to get plugged into the box there, and there are only seven of them. There are more than seven words that you could put in here that would work, but there are only seven words that would require you to then use a comma. And those seven words are for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. Now what's very important again are, is that there, these are the only words that give us a comma. And here I'm just going over some examples so you can see how it looks plugged in. I forgot his name and it's on the tip of my tongue. I don't have the book for I left it on the bus. I have a new job so my schedule is packed. And last, other clauses. There is a huge universe full of all kinds of clauses with all kinds of names. But for the purpose of this video, I just want to give you the basics. And so when I'm saying other clauses, I'm just referring to not independent. I'm basically referring to fragments. These are clauses that usually come before or after an independent clause in a sentence. These clauses cannot work as a sentence alone because they're fragments. Despite my best efforts. Well, there's no verb here, so that's arguably not even quite a clause, but it's definitely a fragment. So we've got this kind of part of a sentence here that is not a complete sentence. Because I left it on the bus, if we didn't have the because, we would have an independent clause. This because is a problem, because it's referencing something that is not in the clause itself. Because I left it on the bus, what? You know, what's, what's the rest of the thought here? We don't know, and so this little clause can't stand alone. We need more of a sentence to make it a complete sentence, a complete thought. And then we have the same problem here with number three, until summer begins. Until summer begins, what? These are all fragments, 
but all three of these can be combined with independent clauses and a comma and become a grammatically correct and correctly punctuated sentence. So before I showed you the independent clause, independent clause um, formula for when you have a comma, this is the other clause, comma, independent clause construction. And we do get this comma here, one of the few cases. A lot of sentences where we think we should have commas actually don't, but this is a construction where we do have a comma. We have some kind of fragment, despite my best efforts, comma, I forgot his name, and that's an independent clause. Because I left it on the bus, comma, I don't have the book. Until summer begins, comma, I have a new job. And of course, sentences can have more than just two clauses. We can have very complex um, sentences or sentences that are considered both complex and compound, all different kinds of constructions. So I'm showing you kind of the basic nuts and bolts of what a complex sentence might look like, but they can be more complex than this. Okay, and that is a wrap. Thank you so much for staying with me. I just want to recap really quick. Um, we covered some information on series dates geography. Remember the geography, you only need two terms, quotations, names when you address people. And then we looked at two different constructions of sentences that have commas comma here, an independent clause, independent clause, and comma here if we have an other clause followed by an independent clause. But the most important thing is when in doubt, leave it out. So if something does not fit the rules of when it's supposed to have a comma, just assume it doesn't have a comma. I really hope you enjoyed these tips. I hope you learned a couple new things. And if you did find it helpful, go ahead and hit the like button. You can subscribe to this channel, get more tips. Um, we have more videos coming out all the time. We have a backlog of really interesting, helpful videos as well. So good luck with your studying, and I wish you all the best on test day.